I'm Chris Long, and I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I'm the president of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute that was founded in 1953 by libertarian journalist Frank Chodorov and a young William F. Buckley, Jr. Uh, from Yale University. Since then, ISI has hosted events like this, uh, uh, like this one tonight on college campuses around the country. Its mission is to inspire students to discover and embrace and advance the principles and virtues that make America free and prosperous. What are the principles that make America free and prosperous? Well, it's not a simple question, especially these days. Generally, we think America's core principles include free enterprise and private property rights, an understanding of limited government and the rule of law as articulated in the Constitution and Declaration, and the concepts of personal responsibility and the sanctity of the individual as embodied in Western tradition. What is the uh, relevance of these principles today's, to today's topic? If America is to advance to new levels of freedom and prosperity so that the next generation is better off than the last, it's hard to deny that we must have it's hard to deny that we must have both technological progress and economic growth. These are big, interesting questions, ones that Peter Thiel has brought to center stage in the current intellectual debate, along with Tyler Cowen, the influential economist at George Mason University, who wrote The Great Stagnation. I'm happy to report that both these thought leaders were involved with ISI students. Peter here at Stanford and Tyler received a graduate school fellowship from ISI to attend Harvard University. I especially want to thank Kyle Hewa and all the students at Stanford who were involved with the Stanford Conservative Society and the Stanford Review, which is one of the many successful legacies of, of Peter Thiel. These students are the ones who will be leading America and the world in the decades ahead. And the fact that they are examining important societal questions like tonight's topic should give, give us all reason for tremendous hope. In fact, I just learned this afternoon that Stanford Review editor Lisa Wallace was awarded an ISI journalism internship and will be working at one of our partners like The Hill, The Weekly Standard, or Tucker Carlson's The Daily Caller this summer. Tonight's uh, debate is less one between optimism versus pessimism in future outlooks and perhaps more about the kind of world we will live in. In Peter Diamandis' uh, new book, Abundance, he points out that today a Maasai warrior on the Serengeti Plain where cell phone penetration will reach 70% by next year, very likely has in the palm of his hand a smartphone with access to Google and thereby more information at his fingertips than the President of the United States had just 15 years ago. At the same time, that Maasai warrior may be hungry, diseased, and with no education or job prospects other than dancing or begging for handouts from a passing Western safari tourist. We might do well to ask at a time when unemployment exceeds 30% in Portugal, 50% in Spain, and uh, more than 25% uh, underemployment among youth in the United States, where are the jobs lost in the information economy? Where is the prosperity lost in those jobs? The World Wide Web of Glass and Light has been called the triumph of mind over matter by George Gilder. Does that beg the question of whether and to what extent matter any more matters in a world of virtual prosperity? And what are the culprits? Neo-mercantilism that ships manufacturing jobs to China, a lack of big R&D programs like Bell Labs, the Apollo program, and the Manhattan Project, the sclerotic impact of layering upon layering of government regulation over the decades, a Fed-driven monetary policy that has for a generation encouraged money to be malinvested in dot-coms, real estate, and now perhaps a bond bubble, Politi politi politically correct universities that have distorted the study of science, the growth of the entitlement state that misallocates resources away from entrepreneurs and into the hands of government bureaucrats. To answer these questions, we have three of the smartest, most thoughtful, and insightful technology gurus on the planet. In order to help connect the dots, we have a legend in Silicon Valley as the moderator. Bill Davidow wrote, Overconnected, the promise and threat of the Internet, as a high-tech executive and venture investor, he helped build Intel, Rambus, and Vitesse, among other great companies. He earned electrical uh, engineering degrees from Dartmouth, Caltech, and Stanford. I highly recommend Overconnected as an insightful examination of how the Internet has created a world of positive feedback loops, operating at a speed and with a complexity which frequently does not allow the human participants to think or reflect 
before what started as a good thing overshoots and becomes a potential calamity. So here to help us through the discussion and to introduce the debate speakers is Bill David Al. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have two of the um, most perceptive and greatest commentators on the Internet age that I could think of. Uh, the first of these is Peter Thiel. Thiel. He was the founder of PayPal. He was the, served as chairman and CEO. He's a legendary investor, had a big position in Facebook, or has one. Um, it w <coughs> was the motivating force between Palantir. Uh, and when I ask everybody that I talked to, and I mentioned that I was coming here to moderate this, and I said Peter was going to be here, the uh, first words out of their mouth were, the smartest person I ever met. Peter has honored, been honored by the World Economic Forum as a young leader, by Business Week as one of the 25 most influential people on the web. He's a supporter of the Singularity Institute, and uh, that's the uh, group that worries about the effects of when machine intelligence becomes smarter than we are. Um, he's an overseer of Hoover, as pointed out, a founder of the Stanford Review, He's a conservative and a libertarian, a supporter of Ron Paul, and a graduate of Stanford, <clears throat> both in philosophy and law. George Gilder was somebody I met in my days at Intel when he was writing for Release One. I used to read George's material to find out if what I was doing was important. George is the chairman of the George Gilder Fund, George Gilder Fund Management, a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute, He's been a speechwriter for Nelson Rockefeller, the other Romney, George, and Richard Nixon. He was one of the pioneers of supply <coughs> side economics. Uh, if you will build it, they will come. He served as a fellow of the Kennedy Institute. Uh, he's an author of 15 books and is about to publish his 16th, Knowledge and Power, <coughs> the, inform <coughs> the Information Theory, uh, of capitalism. It's going to be out in June. Uh, yesterday I picked up the San Francisco Chronicle, the ultra-conservative publication, and I discovered that George was a techno-optimist. So uh, Peter does not consider the iPhone to be a breakthrough, just good packaging of the status quo. And if our new technologies are not generating breakthroughs, economic growth is sure to slow. So this is a real debate uh, tonight. Uh, Peter is going to talk for 15 minutes, then George will talk for 15 minutes, and then there will be five minutes where they will each rebut uh, one another. And the question basically is, is technology accelerating or decelerating, and what are the implications for economic growth? So let's welcome Peter. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm uh, very honored to be here tonight. Uh, I, I, as as, as uh, Bill was saying, I'm on the side that uh, there's been less technological progress than uh, people often advertise in recent decades, and that unless something is done to fix this uh, situation, we're likely to have um, even less in the decades ahead. Uh, it is my position that there was tremendous technological progress in the world from about 1750 to about 1970. Um, and that since uh, the, the early 70s, it has uh, slowed down uh, precipitously. There's one major exception to this. Um, the exception is computers and computer technology and the various spin-offs from that. Uh, and I think we will have plenty of time to discuss how important computers are. But the, uh, the question I want to, uh, to, to start uh, by tackling in these opening comments is to uh, get people to think a little bit about all the other areas of technology where things have decelerated very, uh, very badly, and I would submit that almost everywhere else there's been uh, deceleration. And this is whether we look at uh, whether we look at transportation, energy, uh, commodity production, food production, agrotech, um, all sorts of technologies that didn't even happen, nanotechnology, uh, uh, cognitive enhancement, life extension technologies, uh, and uh, and uh, that uh, that with the exception of computers, we've had tremendous slowdown. Um, um, I, I will not disagree with my uh, my, uh, my sort of friendly uh, rival George Gilder here if he if he's to say that computers have been getting better and cheaper. Um, 
I, I fully agree with that. But uh, what, I, uh, what I would submit to you is that that's not the most important vector or the only vector for us to look at. And uh, let, me, so let me begin with uh, making some comments about some of these other areas. I think uh, if, we, uh, if we start with the most literal version of the question, are we accelerating or decelerating? Or, um, how fast are we moving? The most literal version is to look at transportation. And if you looked at transportation, people moved faster every decade, probably from 1500 on. They had faster sailboats uh, in the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century, faster railroads in the 19th century, faster cars, faster planes. It culminated with the Concorde in 1976. It was uh, decommissioned um, in 2003. And if you uh, add in uh, the uh, sort of very low-tech airport security systems we have these days, you could say that uh, transportation speeds are back to 1960 levels, and it's been literally flat. Um, the space age is more or less over. It sort of ended in 2011 with uh, the decommissioning of the space shuttle, um, even though, if truth were to be told, it probably already ended with uh, the last Apollo end landing in 1972, and the space shuttle program was sort of an extraordinary program that cost more and did less and was probably more dangerous than the original space program of the 50s and 60s. Uh, the most uh, common reason people give for this uh, slowdown in technology in uh, transportation is that it simply costs too much, um, and it took too much fuel to fly supersonic uh, planes. And this, I think, points to the much larger failure in energy innovation, where, uh, where in, in very important ways we have not succeeded in undoing the oil price shocks of the 1970s. Um, you know, oil prices on a per barrel basis, uh, in inflation-adjusted dollars were around $8 a barrel in, uh, in 1973. By the end of the 70s, they were up to uh, close to $100 a barrel. Um, there was a big period in the 80s and 90s where prices came back down, but they've rebounded and over the last uh, four years have basically taken out the highs of the 70s, and, uh, and we basically have an energy situation today that is uh, worse than the Carter catastrophe of the late 70s with oil prices at about $125 a barrel as of, as of today. Uh, on this whole question of technological optimism versus pessimism, parenthetically, there was a very famous bet in 1980 between Julian Simon and Paul Ehrlich, where they sort of looked at a basket of five commodities, and it was a bet on, you know, would things get cheaper or less cheap? And the argument was, you just look at, are these things going to get cheaper? And that will tell us whether we have uh, technological progress or not. And Ehrlich picked five different ones. And uh, he ended up winning on all five, famously, in 1990. If you reran the same bet, um, on a rolling decade basis from 93 to 2003, 94 to 2004. Ehrlich's won the bet every decade since 1993, and he's won it by such a big margin in the last decade that he's more or less undone the price gains of the previous century. Uh, so there is something very, very strange about, uh, about energy innovation. Uh, within the Silicon Valley context, uh, we have, uh, we've had this extraordinary failure of clean tech in the last decade where um, where, uh, and you, you can sort of diagnose, and there are all sorts of debates to what happened. It's a very important question, what went wrong. Uh, but on the most fundamental basis, it, uh, it, it cost too much. It didn't quite work. The technologies didn't work as advertised. And, uh, and it basically was this enormous black hole that uh, probably uh, destroyed a lot of you know, venture capital firms, um, a lot of businesses along with it. And at this point, uh, you could basically uh, say that you know, it's, it sort of has become an increasingly uh, toxic word for, uh, for things, uh, for, for money losing investments. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, nuclear power, of course, has been basically decommissioned. I think it would be, um, it would be, it would be sort of inappropriate and immoral to encourage any young person to study nuclear engineering. Um, it hasn't had much of a future since probably the 70s. Um, and uh, although certainly Fukushima last year did not help in a world that is becoming increasingly hostile to any sort of innovation. Um, if you look at Warren Buffett, who's arguably uh, one of the great investors of all time, um, his single biggest investment is in, um, is in the railroad industry in the U.S. Um, and it's basically a bet against technology. And it's, it's on two levels. It's a bet that people will be traveling more on railroads. And uh, if you look at the main thing railroads transport, it's about 40% by volume is uh, coal. And so he's basic, Buffett is basically making the bet that the U.S., uh, will, um, that the 21st century will look more like the 19th. People will go back to railroads, and instead of having clean tech from oil, all the clean tech will fail, the oil will run out, and we're going to go back to dirty coal. Um, 
um, as we sort of broaden the scope from um, energy, we see the same in, uh, in uh, food production, where uh, you have seen incredible run-up in uh, food productivity. There was a famous uh, green revolution of the 50s and 60s, which uh, increased worldwide food production by something like 125%. Um, in, in those decades from 1950 to about 1980. In the decades since then, it's decelerated tremendously. Uh, there's been about 46% increase in food production since 1980, barely keeping pace with uh, worldwide population growth. And so when you look at things like the Arab Spring, uh, uh, the so-called green revolution that's going on in the Middle East today, uh, you can sort of optimistically, it always gets described as the byproduct of the information age of people twittering and and uh, sort of how great technology is, but, uh, but it, I think, can equally be uh, attributed to a case of technological failure. And the, the sort of, I think the immediate trigger was not democracy or Islam, but that people were just hungry. Uh, food prices had gone up between uh, 50 and 100 percent in the previous year, and you could basically uh, summarize uh, what's happened in the Middle East in the last year as people who had basically become uh, desperate people who have basically become more hungry than scared. Uh, biotechnology is another area where, by all rights, we should be seeing tremendous progress, and we have not seen them. Uh, there, there's been, uh, there are only about a third as many drugs um, in the FDA approval process today as there were 15 years ago. Um, I, I, th I think a lot of it has to do with uh, bad regulation in that area, but, uh, but there's also sort of an increasing sense that, uh, that it's not even possible or worth uh, trying to pursue these things. So, you know, you could say, in, in 1970, the U.S. Congress still believed that we could uh, declare a war on cancer and defeat cancer within six years. It was a resolution that we would defeat it by the bicentennial in 1976. Uh, it's 42 years have elapsed since 1970, and in some sense we're 42 years closer to the goal, but most people uh, think it's more than six years away before we uh, defeat cancer. So the journey's taking longer, has taken longer, and therefore the expected journey is going to take longer than people think. Um, and, of course, all kinds of other major diseases like Alzheimer's, which uh, probably afflict somewhere between a third and a half of the population at age 85, are, um, are not even, um, it's not even part of a public discussion to have a major effort to cure these diseases. People simply no longer believe in technology. Um, I think if you look at the big pharma companies, they've basically, uh, in the last few years, simply started firing all the scientists and researchers who've produced so little for the last 15 years. So I think you sort of have all these different details one can piece together on, um, on what's, been, uh, what's been happening. Uh, now, I, I will concede and have conceded there is a lot happening on the, on the computer and Internet side, but I think the economic and political question is how, how big that is as an aggregate value relative to everything else. And I think the, the easiest way to look at this is looking at the economic data. Uh, median wages in the U.S. have been stagnant since 1973. If you say this is because of uh, rising wealth inequality, even if you factor that in, average wages, the mean has gone up by maybe 20 percent, which is still pretty pathetic. It's like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 percent a year. And you could say that basically, to a first approximation, the innovation in computers has been offset by the depletion in, um, in energy and that we're sort of like uh, Alice in Wonderland where people have had to run harder and harder simply to stay, stay in the same place. So the computer's been going faster, and it's been offset by relentless depletion in energy, which uh, has basically kept, uh, kept the economy in roughly the same place. Now, I think, um, I think one of the things that's very important about this debate is I, I want to you know, say that I'm not happy, like, sort of giving a negative story here, um, you know, I, I work as a venture capitalist. I'm interested in trying to reverse and undo this trend. And so I think we always need to separate the tech slowdown thesis um, as a fact and as a problem. And I try to solve it as a problem because I would like to see the next few decades see a lot more progress than we have seen in the last 40 years. I would like to see some of these sort of this trend towards stagnation and decline reverse itself. But it is also a fact. And when one denies the fact and when one tells utopian stories about a cornucopian future that's just around the corner, um, you will encourage people to make a lot of mistakes, to misallocate a lot of capital. And I believe that, uh, that one of the most extraordinary economic facts of the last few decades has been the series of uh, extraordinarily big and extraordinarily destructive uh, bubbles that have uh, led to the incredible misallocation of a lot of capital. It was the... Uh, 
was, I think it was, the first one was sort of the Japan bubble of the 80s, which was centered on a tech story. There was, the, uh, there was, of course, the tech bubble in Silicon Valley in the 90s, which was most directly centered on a tech story that turned out to be untrue. But even things like the housing finance bubble of the last decade were predicated on the idea that house prices would always go up, and it was because the economy would always grow, and in an in a advanced country, economic growth is driven by... Um, it is driven by... Um, is driven by technological improvement. Um, I think we have an education bubble. We probably have a government bubble. There would be no problem um, in the government uh, taking on all the debt that it's taking on if you had lots of growth. If, uh, if, the, uh, if the underlying economy was growing and was going to double in the next 20 years, there's no problem in doubling the debt. That's, and that's sort of the Krugman-Keynesian uh, argument is we can print money because, uh, because things grow on trees. And I think, I think the uh, people who are on the right in the 20s and 30s were wrong about technological progress. And if they had someone like George Gilder encouraging um, the Fed to print more money in 29, 30, 31, 32, that would have been good. And the Fed at the time believed you couldn't print money because you'd get inflation. And it turned out in the 30s there was incredible technological progress and there was no inflation. You could take the country off the gold standard. You could print money. Money literally grew on trees because there was all this cornucopian progress. The, the politics got screwed up, but the technology was great in the 30s and 40s. That's not the world we're living in today. We're living in a world where people believe this utopian story. Um, they believe that you can print money, that things grow on trees, that technology is easy, that it's automatic, that it's relentless. And, uh, and as a result of believing this, we've gotten sort of trapped in one bubble after another. Um, you know, I think there, there are sort of, you know, sort of a number of different uh, uh, directions one can explore politically. Uh, if you look at uh, why there's so much, um, uh, our political system is as fragmented uh, as it is and as polarized, I think a big part of it is that uh, it's become very hard to craft solutions where everybody comes out ahead. Um, if you look at the Obamacare legislation from a few years ago, where, you know, people can disagree or agree on it, but what's remarkable is I believe it was the most important piece of legislation which was passed on a pure party line vote in the history of the U.S. There was no way to craft it where everybody could come out ahead. You could give uninsured people insurance, but only by reducing the quality of health care for everybody else. And that's the kind of solution you find in a world where there's no growth and where everything's zero sum. Uh, there will be a loser for every winner, and uh, people will start to suspect that the winners are involved in some sort of a racket. That's not the kind of world that I want to live in. Um, I'd like us to find a way out, uh, but I think um, you know, if there is going to be um, a way out of the wilderness we've been wandering in for the last 40 years, uh, we have to start by acknowledging that we're lost in a desert and that we're not in some sort of enchanted forest. Thank you very much. Has progress plateaued? Well, I came to Stanford a few years back, 20 years ago, to uh, interview professors about the future of wireless technology. I'd become uh, enthralled with Qualcomm's CDMA, and uh, I consulted the leading figure at Stanford on uh, radio technology. His name was Bruce Lusignan. He had 16 patents in signal processing. He was uh, uh, a titan of uh, wireless. And he uh, told me that CDMA violated the laws of physics and uh, that Qualcomm was very irresponsible in promoting this uh, untenable technology. And... Uh, he, uh, at the time, uh, he said that, uh, in fact, it would be better to invest more in analog technology because uh, the laws of physics actually favor analog. You use the whole uh, wave in order to transmit information rather than just sampling the wave a couple times a uh, second that the Nyquist rate to get... Uh, an approximation of the signal. And so uh, we really should uh, continue in analog and actually invest more in analog. And 
as I studied this uh, uh, subject, I came to the c conclusion that uh, Lou Signan was right, that uh, analog was preferable. It did accord with the laws of physics. But the laws of physics no longer determine the prospects of technology. CDMA, based on Shannon's information theory, trumped the laws of physics. And as a result, uh, we have uh, this incredible uh, proliferation of wireless technology today. There are 300 billion smartphones. Uh, 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 now there'll be, uh, uh, I mean, three, uh, 300 million smartphones, and, uh, which is uh, expanding to 2 billion in four years, um, with some 200 billion apps projected. These smartphones are not just phones, they are full Turing machines. They uh, reflect the full insights of the information revolution that was uh, instigated by uh, Shannon and, and all the other great leaders of uh, information technology over the years, including John Hennessy was a major contributor. And as a matter of fact, one of the uh, exciting facets of Stanford is that it is oriented toward information technology rather than toward uh, uh, ex further exploitations of uh, academic physics, which is increasingly fruitless, as uh, um, Peter understands. But uh, information theory is not merely applicable to computer technology. It springs from computer technology. And, uh, but it is a powerful theory that also uh, explains and provides huge promise for biological technology. Genetics is based on information theory. And so a understanding of information theory can be extended into major breakthroughs in, uh, in bioengineering. Now, bioengineering is one of the areas that has floundered in Peter's vision, but I believe that uh, we're just turning a corner in bioengineering because we're moving away from a kind of uh, uh, exper experimental uh, uh, random model of how uh, biology works to an understanding that uh, biology is an intelligent system based on, uh, on uh, DNA. And a few hundred lines of uh, nucleotides of DNA have more information in them than all the current laws of physics as we understand them. Uh, it's, uh, information theory is more powerful than physics. And uh, its impact uh, will extend across all the, uh, the various fields, and it's, it's transforming them as we speak. When I, I've rec I recently read a paper about uh, a time which I think resembles our current era, and that was uh, a paper by William Nordhaus of Yale on uh, the history of lighting. And uh, he, he uh, and the millions of years of history of lighting, starting with cave fires, moving through candles and whale oil, and uh, the finally electricity and lighting, and now white lighted, light emitting diodes, the whole history. And uh, he showed that uh, the tremendous benefits that lighting conferred and the complete blindness of all the experts to what was being accomplished uh, before their eyes. All three, uh, most of the experts on the Industrial Revolution uh, thought it was actually immiserating workers. 
of when uh, workers at the beginning of it uh, essentially spent most of their time in the dark, and by the end uh, they had, uh, uh, you know, tremendous uh, candle power and, uh, and heating and just huge advances in their standards of living and capabilities and, and the dimensions of their lives. Uh, but, uh, and indeed, in Nordoff's calculation, he shows that the price of lighting, of lighting at night, had uh, dropped just millions and millions of fold. It's down to, you know, virtually too small to count now. Uh, and the only bad period was when they, in Britain in the early 18th century, they imposed a 30% tax on candles. And uh, that caused a brief dark age that was accompanied by protection of, uh, of uh, domestic gin production. So everybody drank tremendously in the dark. But, uh, uh, but the, the fact is we're in a, a period of incredible advances across the board everywhere you look. And, uh, and uh, we are really entering a golden age of technology. And... It's uh, uh, looking at uh, failures in big Ballyhooed government programs uh, uh, like the space program or, or carping about uh, TSA in the airports is really beside the point. I've just flown from uh, Bangkok uh, uh, or visited my... Uh, daughter deep in uh, boondocks where she had better internet connections than I do here. And, uh, and it's, uh, and that uh, air flight is, uh, because of these airplanes, suffused with computer, designed with computer technology, uh, the CAD programs and CAE programs and programs redesigning the materials, the, the whole, uh, means that uh, air travel is cheaper than ever before, safer than ever before, and uh, while you fly, uh, while you're at, in Bangkok, there was a sign, uh, there was a billboard I passed that said, at this very moment, there is uh, 500 million people in the air. And... Uh, as I discovered, many of them are on the air. They all had Wi-Fi on my plane, and, uh, and they're in cocoons of productivity and entertainment, uh, and uh, it's, it's, air travel is one of the most stupendous successes uh, technologically uh, that I've experienced in my life, and it's, been, it's still improving rapidly. And, and uh, that... Uh, Maasai, uh, you know, nanotech is, has failed because, uh, partly because of a false model introduced by Richard Feynman nearby. And uh, he had a mistaken view of nanotech that imagined a kind of continued predominance of physics that... Uh, that uh, physicists could go in and build new molecules atom by atom and uh, bottom up and uh, create a, a kind of uh, mechanical nanotech. But uh, nanotech, that's a Drexlerian, Feynman's nanotech is, uh, is a delusion. Uh, you have uh, Brownian motion functioning in the gigahertz. You've got tremendous sticky Reynolds numbers. You, you, it's just not uh, a, a feasible project to do nanotech the way uh, uh, Feynman and Drexler envisage it. But uh, I've been investing in a nanotech company in... Uh, Vermont that uh, is bringing water to the Maasai. It just got a $10 million investment from a company called Econet that has 70% of the cell phone service in Africa and uh, has discovered that uh, when you sell cell phones, you also want to sell water. 
because the people need water as much as they do cell phone service. And so uh, 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 this company in uh, Windsor, Vermont, Selden Technologies, has figured out how to use carbon nanotubes, manufacture them as uh, an old paper mills, old paper mill technology, and uh, filter water uh, without uh, any chemicals, without uh, any power usage, and uh, remove both bacteria and uh, viruses in a tunable way. They can tune these nanotube papers to uh, focus on different kinds of filtration. And uh, they're about to engineer a real transformation of all filtration technology based on using carbon nanotubes in an ordinary chemical kind of process uh, that uh, doesn't uh, produce some magical new uh, revelation of physics uberalis, but does allow people to uh, uh, drink water through a straw out of a septic tank and get not only uh, potable water, but delicious water. And uh, this is the kind of advance that's underway. And it's, it's, a lot of it is, uh, is not happening in the United States. Uh, I spend a lot of time in uh, Israel these days because uh, the real Silicon Valley, in my judgment, has moved to Israel. But that doesn't really matter. Israel is uh, so closely linked to Silicon Valley that its uh, breakthroughs are immediately transmitted here. And it's saving uh, American technology at a time of doldrums for many of the reasons that, that Peter mentions. But, Again, water technology is vital to the Egyptians and Iranians, who are the two biggest importers of, of uh, water in the form of grain. And, uh, but Israel has completely beaten the water challenge while nobody was looking. Israel, uh, since the foundation of Israel, its population has increased tenfold. Its uh, agricultural production has increased 16-fold. Its industrial production has increased 50 to 60 fold, and uh, its uh, use of land has increased three fold, and its use of water, its net use of water, has declined 10 percent. It's down 10 percent. They now get uh, half their water from desalinization plants. They recycle uh, 95 percent of their sewage, they uh, 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 use uh, incredibly uh, refined uh, uh, drip irrigation techniques that direct the uh, uh, water directly to the plants uh, hundreds of times more efficiently than, uh, than uh, ditches. This is an amazing world out there. You should go out and investigate it. Well, let me uh, let me say three uh, make three quick comments. One on this question of who is an expert, and I, I do not question that you are an expert on all the specific technologies you've described. But um, who is really an ex first? Who is really an expert on this question of technology more broadly? And uh, I think, as you rightly noted, a lot of the experts in the early 20th century were too pessimistic. I believe a lot of the experts today are too optimistic, um, and uh, they generally think that innovation is something that happens on its own. It's not really a subject worthy of study, and it's just sort of an automatic variable that uh, gets thrown into the macroeconomic equations that dominate everything. Uh, uh, I think if we, if we are somewhat skeptical of experts on these bigger questions, uh, if you look at what average people think, um, they certainly seem to be having much less optimism about the future. And if you took a survey of how many people in the U.S. think the next generation of Americans will be better off than the current generation, um, that percentage has uh, steadily gone down for the last 40 years. And the optimism about the future has gradually come out of the system. The experts will tell them about uh, 
all sorts of incredible things that are just around the corner, but um, after 40 years of waiting, uh, fewer and fewer people believe it. And I think there is, there is a lot to be, uh, I, I think the sort of common sense experience that uh, a lot of people have should not be simply dismissed out of hand. Um, people find they have to work much longer hours than they, than they did uh, 40 years ago. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a Zurban Schreiber, this French writer who uh, in 1967 wrote a book called The American Challenge and said that the U.S. had an ex technologically accelerating civilization. By the year 2000, the average work week in the U.S. for the average person would be four um, days a week, seven hours a day with 13 weeks a year of paid vacation time. And, um, and people like to say, well, if he was French. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think... I think, uh, I think we have to really take seriously, how does the common sense experience differ? If you're, if you're looking at the world from outer space and you listen to George Gilder and you're saying, well, everything's great in Silicon Valley, you say, well, you know, maybe it's great in California generally as a place that's sort of, that's sort of separate. Uh, and this was a great place to go in the 1930s. It was one of the best places in the world because that's where technological progress was happening. It was the aerospace industry, the, um, you know, the uh, movie industry, all the new industries were happening in California. And people moved from Oklahoma to California. That's what the grapes of wrath. Uh, if, you ha if you actually looked at the demographic trends today, people are moving from California to Oklahoma, which I would submit again is um, not a great uh, tech trend. Um, the, uh, the question of how we measure all these things, I think, is endemic to it, um, endemic to much of our debate. I would submit you measure it in economic terms. Are people uh, better off economically? Uh, but I think there's also sort of this uh, philosophical question that's linked to the economic question. Let me just sort of highlight that and sort of uh, uh, is a little bit related to some of the points Chris Long made in his opening uh, comments. And it's sort of this question, what is more important? Is the world fundamentally driven by bits and information or is it fundamentally uh, stuff and sort of real things in the real world, physical objects? And uh, I, I, believe that, uh, I believe we are in a world where um, innovation in stuff was outlawed. It was basically outlawed in the last 40 years. Part of it was environmentalism. Part of it was risk aversion. Um, and, um, and all the engineering disciplines that had to do with stuff have basically been outlawed one by one. I went to Stanford in the uh, mid-'80s. If one had um, – engineering was not a great field to go into in general. If you, if you went to computer engineering, that was good. Financial engineering was also good. That's the one other area where there's been a lot of progress because that's simply a world of bits. But everything else was outlawed. Um, you know, petroleum engineering, nuclear engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, me mechanical engineering, um, bioengineering. These were terrible decisions people uh, made who went into these, into these fields. And, uh, and it was sort of, and, and then if you say, well, you know, it doesn't matter. All that matters is the world of bits and not the world of stuff. Um, there's sort of a question whether this is actually true and whether we really should have this sort of um, ghost-like reductionism where we simply think of the world um, as consisting of a virtual computer, if that's sort of our model for the universe or something like that. Uh, whereas, again, the common sense experience is that uh, we're physically embodied. We live in this world. We need to eat food, just take the most basic thing. And uh, it, is, it is perhaps, you know, um, and, you know, if people need to eat bread or something like that every day, it's not adequate to respond to them and tell them, um, you know, um, let them eat iPhones. <laughs> well, I, I certainly agree that uh, matter is important. And uh, the question is, uh, is how you address matter and uh, whether you uphold the materialist superstition or whether you understand that matter is ultimately subordinate to mind and that technologies that enhance human mental capacity and capability uh, are ultimately uh, the most human technologies and the most important ones. Tyler Cowen grouses that the Internet is, uh, chiefly favors the cognitive elites. Well, uh, life favors the cognitive elites. Uh, the, uh, the whole um, economy is ultimately dependent on a very small cognitive elite. And, uh, and uh, the world economy is uh, uh, dependent on a cognitive elite. And as the Internet converges this cognitive elite and uh, brings it to a critical mass and makes it uh, more capable of addressing all these uh, 
material problems, they will look a lot less serious. Now, uh, uh, Peter's worried about energy. I'm not worried about energy at all. I never imagined that clean tech was, uh, uh, was a reasonable project for America when we have oil and gas and huge quantities, as we're increasingly discovering. And uh, in the last several years, uh, enough natural gas has been uh, uh, developed to uh, hundreds of trillions of cubic feet, enough to uh, s support uh, the economy for the next uh, 200 years. Uh, it's in new techniques are constantly being developed for uh, tapping uh, uh, deep oil and oil shale and uh, other forms of uh, oil. And, uh, and uh, you know, we can block a, a pipeline from time to time, but uh, the inexorable advance of these technologies is very impressive. And this is all information tools that made this possible. This is a further consummation of the information age that has permitted us to discover um, gas, gas and oil that was previously regarded to be inaccessible. Um, you know, we've got a kind of Maxwell's demon at large in the world, uncovering uh, new material capabilities through our ever-advancing information technologies. And, and I, th I think, and these uh, cover all the fields of science. They are, physics now is, in, is chiefly devoting its uh, hopes to something called quantum information theory. Christopher Hughes is a great figure in it. My daughter wrote a book about it called The Age of Entanglement. And this really is the uh, uh, great hope in physics. Uh, this, uh, the American commitment to, in, to uh, information theory is uh, a great strength of our economy. Now, on these other points, I agree with Peter. I don't want to uh, seem to be too much a pushover, but I completely agree that uh, that culturally we had this massive revulsion toward technology. Uh, we we started worshiping trees again, and uh, and uh, we became druids, creating these sun hinges around the country, uh, and uh, it's uh, we're we really had a mania. And I think this mania probably is coming to an end now. But uh, it is still a problem. It's still a problem at Stanford University. Thank you, George and Peter. I, I'm going to ask a few questions. And then by me doing it, you're all going to gain a tremendous amount of nerve. And you're going to start holding up your hands. So I uh, looked at a little data for this before I came here, and I discovered that the gross national product of the United States was $15 trillion. We had 130 million non-farm jobs in the United States, which came out to be about $115,000 of economic productivity per employee. Then I went around and I looked and I discovered that Google revenue was around 1.2 million an employee. And then I looked at Walmart and found out that they had 2 million associates and were delivering 200 billion in sales, and they were doing about $100,000 an employee. And I looked at Amazon and they had 48 billion in sales, and they had 56,000 employees, and they were producing about $800,000 in income per employee. And what I concluded by this is that before we had the virtual economy, a million dollars in economic growth created eight to ten jobs. And with the virtual economy, it's creating maybe on the order of one or two. So I would like to know what are our prospects for economic growth and how is this going to affect the middle class in the coming years. And George, why don't you take a first shot at this? I, I, I think this is... Uh, uh, 
a false problem. It's a false way to uh, view technological progress to imagine that increasing productivity, which is what you're describing, uh, actually translates into less employment. Uh, product uh, employers uh, want productive workers. The more productive workers become, the more readily they can be employed and the more employment will occur. Uh, I, th I think at present, uh, we are in the middle of a, a global recession following uh, an appalling financial uh, hypertrophy that uh, uh, governments panicked about, and I think it was a mistake. And uh, so people who have dismal projections of employment once again have their day in the sun. Uh, they had their day in the sun in the 70s. They had their day in the sun th throughout history. But uh, 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 here we are in a depression uh, comparable to the 30s depression from some points of view, and we have radically less unemployment. And uh, I think uh, that uh, the productivity of the new technologies that are emerging will uh, actually increase employment. I think it is absolutely critical that the U.S. get serious about uh, technology, that it, that it not uh, force uh, immigrants to the United States to return after they complete their Stanford education. Uh, I mean, we are absolutely doing utterly self-destructive, stupid things day after day after day, and we're paying for it. Uh, you can tell that uh, there are other policies that work better uh, by visiting Israel and other countries. China and Israel are two countries I've visited that uh, show that this is not a world of lessening opportunities. It's a world of exploding new horizons. Uh well, I, I generally um, agree with uh, you, at least in theory. I, I think that uh, uh, if you have technological progress, uh, it frees people up to do more productive things. And that's how we should think of it. You know, when you shut down the horse buggy factory, the, um, there are a lot more jobs building cars, and, and, and people are generally, uh, generally better off as, uh, as, as, as you have these things happen. I think the, uh, at the same time, um, you have to reflect on the fact that if you gave that sort of a speech in Detroit and, uh, and people who were working in car factories asked you, well, what would you do? And you said you have one word for them, computers. Um, uh, you probably, you, this would not be good advice if you say we're running for Congress or something like that. And, and I think this would be true, um, this would be true not just in Detroit, but in, in most of the U.S. Uh, and so the, uh, while I agree with you that there have been um, a few jobs that have been very productivity enhancing and there is a, there is a, uh, there is a thin tip of the spear of the computer revolution that continues apace. Uh, it is not clear it's enough to drive the whole economy. And no political leader uh, can comfortably say you should look to Silicon Valley because there is some sense in which it's not actually creating enough wealth to really, really transform things. And that, I think that's why, um, that's why, even though I agree with you in theory, I think in practice um, it's not a compelling argument because... Uh, People sense there's something a little bit fishy about it. The numbers don't quite add up. If I, you know, if the, the Google analysis is, of course, Google's a monopoly. It's a monopoly search engine company. Um, it only works as long as there's nobody else doing it. And, uh, and so, by definition, it is a company that only works as long as you have a few thousand people that can do it. It's, by definition, not scalable. And, and I think that's, a, that's sort of... That's sort of a question that one, one should explore a lot more. And that's why uh, you can't say everybody should be like Google. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I uh, began looking around, and I discovered that something was kind of interesting. Uh, when the railroad came along, we completely rebuilt the infrastructure of the world. I mean, we created the industrial city, and then we had suburbs that stretched along the railroad tracks and things like that. And then the automobile came along, and society went from being linear to being two-dimensional, and we ended up with shopping malls and things like this. So the Internet comes along. 
And it's a new level of interconnectivity, and these levels of interconnectivity, society has always been optimized around them. So uh, what kind of a physical society do we end up with in the Internet, and do we end up with a construction boom? A construction boom? Uh, we should. Uh, it's almost, it's very difficult to er erect buildings in the United States because uh, we do have a uh, uh, national campaign against uh, carbon footprints, and unfortunately we're all made of carbon, uh, which uh, uh, makes it difficult to uh, uh, decarbonize our impact. But... Uh, but I, th I think uh, that, uh, that we will have a new economic boom that will resemble previous economic booms. All of them do reflect uh, technological advances. Uh, uh, some of these uh, attempts uh, will fail, and uh, there will be crashes, and there will be new periods of uh, dismal reflections and prophecies. But uh, I think that uh, uh, the incredibly bad policy we've been following explains the current situation. And there's a great vanity in government to imagine that if we retrench current levels of government spending, it'll be a catastrophe. And all history tells us that when you cut government spending, it's all upside. Uh, it uh, releases new energies. It results in new employment, it uh, improves the lives of everyone. And I th my new book is full of examples of where countries like uh, radically reduce their government spending with tremendous uh, upside. And, uh, and uh, reducing tax rates first is a perfectly uh, tenable uh, strategy. I'm, I remain a supply sider, and I think that, uh, that this is a good stance that the Republicans are taking today to refuse to uh, raise tax rates. Now, I, I think that the current tax system is a disgrace to the human race, so it should be radically simplified and flattened. And, but uh, all these policy changes will have the same kind of... Uh, effects that they've always had. And uh, so the, depress the psychological depression we're undergoing today, I think, is uh, misconceived. I guess where I was trying to get to, George, was I picked up the Wall Street Journal today, and I was looking at it, and they were talking about the shopping centers going away. And uh, I began scratching my head, saying, gee, what happens to all this physical space in an Internet-driven world? Do we end up with shopping centers being repurposed? Do we end up saying people want to live in cities because they can connect differently? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that, Peter? Well, I, I think in, in theory there is a lot of – there are you, – you need less physical buildings if uh, – to the extent it makes things more efficient. And I think, uh, I think there definitely are parts of that where that's – that is the case. Uh, uh, certainly, um, my intuition, on the other hand, again, is that maybe computers are 20% and the other 80% of the economic value consists in big things in the physical real world, as, I, as, as opposed to the virtual world of, of the bits. And, uh, and so I think the constraints on, on construction are quite serious. You know, it took, in the uh, 30s, people were able to build the Empire State Building from start to finish in one and a half years. Uh, it's taken over 10 years to replace the World Trade Center. Uh, my, my off, the back of my office is the uh, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It was built uh, under FDR in three years in the 30s. Um, at this point, they're in the process of building an access ramp onto the bridge um, that's costing about as much as the original bridge and is taking seven years to build. Now, now if, you, if you say that, if you say that uh, the, these physical things don't matter, these are not problems you need to worry about. And, um, and I, I think they do matter quite a bit, and I think that's, they're definitely, you know, you definitely would, would free up a lot on this. Uh, one place I, I do disagree with uh, George on is, um, I, you know, I, I'm certainly, I like, I don't like paying taxes, um, and I'd like taxes to be lower, uh, but I, I don't really think that 
lower taxes are this panacea at this point. And I think that uh, if I had to give a policy recommendation, I think, uh, I think most of it is, is micro-regulatory. And I think that uh, you know, if, if, um, if I could actually spend the money I earn on buying drugs that are not l legal right now um, by the FDA and otherwise, or if I could, uh, if I could uh, b build a house that's not zoned in crazy ways, or if I could do any of a number of things, um, I'd, um, I'd be fine paying more in taxes if I actually got to keep and, and spend the other half of my money as I saw fit. And, uh, and so in effect, we have, we, have a very, we have a very low, we don't have a super high tax rate in certain ways, but we have a very high tax rate if you sort of say that uh, you can't really do all that much with your money because uh, so much uh, innovation has been, uh, has been effectively uh, micro-regulated to death. So that's sort of where I would focus the, uh, I would focus, uh, the effort. I want to focus on that, too. I mean, I think regulation is absolutely uh, maniacal and, and uh, out of control, and it's destroying our economy. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you on that at all. Okay, I'd like to hear from some of the people in the audience. How about you? Okay, I, I'm going to try and rephrase that so everybody can hear me, but Stanford students have app mania. And uh, the, the question was, is this part of the revolution or, or not? So, George? The app mania. Yeah, and I, I guess implicit in that is it is a smart thing for Stanford students to be fiddling with. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing development. And I think uh, the skills that are formed and tapped in uh, producing these new apps are valuable, and uh, the disciplines uh, incurred are valuable. Uh, so that uh, I think it's a good phenomenon. I, I think it has its obvious limits, and and uh, these, uh, you know, this projection of 200 billion downloaded apps in four years uh, suggests that uh, most of the world will. Uh, uh, do nothing but download apps, and I think that's probably uh, an unwise use of time. Well, if, if, if you, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's um, a good idea to necessarily judge what people are doing, and so, uh, so, uh, and so the, there's sort of a question whether it's the right thing for people to do individually as an economic decision, uh, and one can have a lot of debates about it. I suspect too many people are doing it. I suspect that um, the actual ratio of these things really working to the amount of effort isn't all that great. Uh, but I think the, the question that's, uh, that's worth asking is sort of, um, is why are they not doing anything else? Uh, it, it, to sort of take, uh, and I don't know if that's the only thing people are doing, but why is it so much that? And I would again submit that uh, there's no obvious path for other things that, uh, that make sense. So, you know, there's, there's a, like there's a version of this with the, the anti-Wall Street bias where you know, we have all these rocket scientists they went to work on Wall Street. And sort of the bias is, well, we shouldn't have all these people working on Wall Street. But, um, but I would say, you know, I would say the, uh, part of the problem is they were no longer allowed to build rockets or do things in the aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have to sort of, that's sort of the half-empty version of this, that uh, we live in a world where doing things in the real world is heavily restricted. There isn't that much you can do. In the world of uh, bits, in the virtual world, you know, finance, computers, that's where you can do things. But then it may be, it may be um, and I think it's enough to, it's probably enough for um, 1,500 people at Stanford to get decent paying jobs doing that. It's not clear. It's enough to really take our civilization to the next level on its own terms. Uh, Peter, you've had this project where you've been giving, I, I want to say, sort of $100,000 fellowships to kids before they graduate from college. And are most of those things in the information area or are they in other areas? Maybe you could tell people what you are doing. Yeah, this is a, we've, we, uh, we started a program about uh, a year and a half ago to uh, uh, um, give uh, $100,000 uh, fellowships to uh, people to stop out of school for two years and work on something technologically intensive that had the potential to, to really um, to really improve things. Uh, and, uh, and so we've generally not funded people who are just doing apps. We think, you know, people are going to do that anyway in their spare time. We don't, it is my judgment that it's 
for the most part, not really going to take our civilization to the next level. Um, I think that, uh, but I think that's, you know, that's obviously, there's, there's sort of a common sense intuition. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, again, if you had, I don't like picking on individual companies, but if you take a company like, uh, like Twitter, um, uh, the standard wrap on it is, you know, it's, you know, how is this really valuable? You just have 140 characters on an SMS basis. It's valued at about $8 billion in the secondary market at this point. And I think the debate about something like Twitter is always framed as a debate of specific success or specific failure. Um, and um, my view is that Twitter is actually a tremendous specific success. There are about 700 people who work there. I think they will have I think the company will be around for decades to come. They will have well-paying jobs for the next 20 years or so. Um, I don't, however, believe, I believe, however, that it may be also symptomatic of some sort of general failure. And so I think you can have specific success, but uh, in a context where there are not enough companies that really move the dial being built, um, the specific success may still uh, be uh, masking this general failure. And that's, that's the way I think a lot of this needs to be thought of. Okay, is there another question? Yeah. So, so the question is, is teaching entrepreneurship productive? Well, I have to be somewhat biased on this since I'm teaching a class on that next quarter. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it is, I think the, the question I would, I would tackle on this is, um, and the way I'm going to orientate it towards is that um, it, is, um, it is probably wrong to frame it as entrepreneurship, though. So it's, uh, it is, um, and so, you know, it's one of the people who worked for me um, was talking a few years ago and said, well, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And well, it's clear in 10 years I want to be an entrepreneur. And it's sort of like if you're a writer, it's like saying, you know, I want to be famous or, um, you know, what's your plan? I want to become rich. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think that people become entrepreneurs because they have important problems to solve and, uh, and starting a company turns out to be the best format they find for solving problems. They could also solve these problems in big companies. They might solve them in universities and government and nonprofit. I personally believe that a lot of um, important problems can be solved in the context of creating new businesses. Um, but I think the question it's, it's not around some mania for starting new businesses where you sort of narcissistically look into yourself and say, what can I do to be an entrepreneur and I can bake chocolate chip cookies, so I'm going to start a chocolate chip cookie company. Um, it's, 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 it needs to be oriented towards uh, what, it, what are important problems that need to be solved. Uh, and I, I do think there are a lot of important problems that uh, need to be solved and that can be solved and that people are not working on. And... Uh, as long as it's framed within that uh, context, I, I think there's a lot to be said for it. So you're sure. really saying no, though, right? I mean, you're saying that uh, studying entrepreneurship in itself is really ocios. Uh, that's not uh, the right target. You should be mastering some particular skill, some particular set of tools that allow you to accomplish something that other people need to have done. And uh, it's the development of these tools that really is important. And, and studying entrepreneurship in itself takes you one step away from the actual substance of your business, and I think is probably yes. a mistake. Yes, I, I agree. I think, I, think that, um, I, think there is, I think there is room for both learning things about process and substance, but I think it should be about 80% substance and 20% process, and there's a way to get the process and do things right and a way to do the things better. But we, you know, there's probably one of those sort of diagnostics of what's gone wrong is that we've substituted process thinking for substantive thinking in many different domains in our society over the last 40 years where we think, um, and it's, it's, it's a lot easier, the process is a lot easier and so in a world where everyone thinks substantively, there may be some procedural shortcuts where you just, um, you know, if you have a lot of people substantively thinking about how to invest in the stock market, uh, the procedural shortcut is to buy an index fund. Yeah. Um, but it, it, doesn't, it may not work if everyone does process. Right. And, uh, and we're probably in a world where things are, 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 are way too geared towards process and away from substance. And we're even patenting business 
processes or business methods. I mean, it's, it's just really ludicrous. I mean, what do businesses do? They experiment with methods and processes. They don't need a patent for it. I don't know. I mean, it's this kind of, I mean, the patent system is another problem that's uh, gotten out of hand in the United States over the last decade or so. A uh, recent study by uh, BU, a really scrupulous, systematic study of the impact of uh, software and business method patents, showed that uh, after litigation, uh, the loss and the, of, and the defendants, the people who have been sued by the patent trolls, is a total of a half a trillion dollars over uh, a decade. Uh, this is a really just absurd uh, uh, abuse in the United, in the United States, and it's abu an abuse of litigation, which I think is kind of a cancer of capitalism, where lawyers studying entrepreneurship exploit the law uh, to the advantage of lawyers. And luckily, all the judges are lawyers, and all the congressmen are lawyers, and the senators are all lawyers, so they get to have this absurd racketeering legal profession in America uh, that uh, is very destructive and it's manifested in the abuse of the patent system. Uh, so right over here. Okay, so the, if I had to restate the question it is that the government made really long-term technology investments and venture capitalists just go for the gold tomorrow and so we aren't going to be inventing the internet and things like this uh, because we are so short-term oriented and what's going to replace this? So, Peter? Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, know if I, you know, I don't know if I entirely agree with your darkly pessimistic thesis that, uh, <laughs> that, it, is, uh, that uh, it, is, uh, it is all uh, basically um, uh, uh, that war is the sort of uh, father of all things or something like that and, uh, and the driver of all, all innovation. Um, there's certainly, uh, there's certainly, certainly one, if that premise is true, sort of one, you know, sort of I, one of the things I didn't talk about that much is why things have slowed down. I sort of gave, my, my, my bias tends to be libertarian, which is that it's slowed down because of government regulation. Uh, there's obviously a liberal argument, which would be that uh, we haven't been investing enough in science and engineering uh, degrees and that sort of the schools are broken. You can sort of have sort of a debate along those lines. And I think there's sort of a conservative argument, which is that it was driven by military spending. Um, but I think the a problem with the uh, conservative um, account of the driver of innovation is that uh, clearly we have a point now where the weapons are strong enough to blow up the world. And so um, it's not, it doesn't motivationally work. And so you could say that, uh, you know, the space race ended, uh, really ended in 1975 when you had the Apollo-Soyuz docking. <coughs> If we were just going to dock the uh, spaceships and all be friends, why should people work 80 or 100 hours a week to build uh, um, rockets that are really being designed to launch missiles at the other side? Um, and so I think that's, that certainly is a line of inquiry that's worth pursuing. But, but the problem is that uh, you know, when you're in a, in a world where technology is powerful enough to destroy the world several times over, you're not going to motivate additional technological work uh, that's simply designed to kill people. And so uh, the, the motivation has, you have to have some, you have to have some, um, some way that you motivate people to, um, to sort of sacrifice their time and work on projects that, uh, um, uh, that is, that's not motivated by war. And I think that's sort of the cultural what's, what's challenge. What's Palantir doing? It's a, uh, well, it is, it is a, I would say it's, it's a, a big data company that is, it has certainly a defensive military application as well as a, uh, as well as a sort of uh, corporate uh, um, companies preventing fraud, break-in, uh, theft. I think there's, there's some room for that. Um, but I, th I, 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 don't, I, I don't think the offensive military stuff is, is, is a way that, uh, that you, can, uh, you can really motivate uh, things at this point in our, in our society. Um, and I... You know, and again, the, 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 his, the history is obviously, there's a lot of other things that have changed with this history. So, uh, so I would say, even if we grant your premise that it was military spending that drove technology, um, it's also the case that our government today would no longer do this. And so if you had a letter from Einstein to the White House, it would be treated as a joke. It would get thrown in the waste paper basket, 
we, we would assume that nobody has that sort of expertise to, uh, to push for something like that. Um, uh, you know, I think we still have the DARPA program in place. The amount of money that's spent by DARPA is probably as, uh, as great as it was in the 50s and 60s. The money somehow being spent much less well. And so there's this question about the bureaucratization of these processes that's very bad. And so if I had to give a libertarian account of what's gone wrong with government spending on science, it would be that uh, you know, in the 20s and 30s, we had um, you know, very talented scientists working in a, and technologists working in a decentralized way. Um, and it was possible to take that ecosystem and give it a one-time tremendous acceleration. You could pump money into it, and you could, you could basically uh, tremendously um, accelerate the innovation for about 20 or 30 years. But it came at the price of politicizing science and making science something where it would be subject to political decisions of who gets the money, peer reviews for, for grants, and the sort of whole complicated uh, political process. And uh, just as in um, you know, Platonic theory, um, uh, the philosopher king is an oxymoron because philosophers are bad at being kings. So the scientist politician is also an oxymoron. Maybe it's even the exact same oxymoron. And, um, and uh, great scientists are fundamentally really different from great politicians. And, uh, and so we have a world today where there are about 100 times as many scientists as there were in 1920. Um, if my deceleration thesis is correct, the productivity per scientist is less than 1% of what it was in 1920. Okay, I, the, uh, George, George we, I think what we have to do is wrap it up here. So I'm going to ask Chris to come on up.